Well, here we are live at the Obama Foundation Summit in Chicago. Welcome to the first inaugural Obama Foundation Summit. I will be your host, Hannah Hart. You may know me from my various exploits on the internet or my television show on Food Network called I Heart Food. But today isn't about me, sadly, it's about us. And by us, I mean all of us, which is what the Obama Foundation's mission is all about. It's about community and engagement and empowering those to change positive, to affect positive change in their world. Today we're going to be joined by 500 different civic leaders as they work into breakout sessions and really, I guess, kind of motivate and inspire each other during these interesting times that we live in. Hopefully that uh, is what you guys think. Today and tomorrow, they're going to be exchanging uh, ideas, exploring creative solutions, and working together to experience uh, an increase in civic art and technology. But there's no one here that can better discuss the Obama Foundation than their CEO himself, David Seamus, who's right next to me. I was gonna prattle on about your organization, but it also seems like you're the man who should really be here to talk about it. Hannah, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I can't think of a better way for you to engage as a citizen to bring the skills that you have to try to make your community a little bit better. Uh, this is our beginning. Uh, and the best way to think about it is back in January, the president was here in Chicago and he gave his farewell address. And he said that he was asking people to believe not in his ability to bring about change, but in theirs. And that goes to the heart of who we are, mm. not waiting for change to happen from others. Yeah. But if you see a problem, if you see something that you want to change, you have a responsibility as a citizen, a member of a community to lift up and do it. I absolutely believe that myself wholeheartedly. David, there is one question uh, that I know is on the tops of minds of everybody here today. Why Halloween? Uh, so Chicago <laughs> and Halloween uh, is, a is there a real reason? Well, no, I'm just making oh, okay, that up, good. actually. <laughs> you know, we were going to have a booth with candy, but... Yeah. Uh, no tricks, not, only no, treats here today. exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, David, for you, what really would you like to see the 500 participants here today take away from this experience? I want to see them inspire each other. I want to see them connect with one another. And then I want to see them learn from one another. Mm -hmm. So the president went to Chicago multiple times, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Berlin, Germany, in front of 75,000 young people at the Brandenburg Gate, Jakarta. And he asked each one of those groups what they did that worked and what they did that didn't work. And what we've done over the course of the past nine months is essentially built a list invited people and the 500 people you see here are either rising citizen stars or established change makers and so the experience that they're going to have with one another uh, my favorite example is paul green from eastern kentucky mm -hmm. who's developed a stem science and technology protocol for kids in the public schools there sitting down with sheldon smith from the south side of chicago who's been dealing with issues on the South Side and what they can teach each other, mm. what they can learn from each other, and then for us as a foundation, that's completely predicated on this. Our programming for the course of the next year is gonna be informed by the conversations we hear today. I, I honestly believe that people give so much credit to words, but not enough credit to actions. And it seems like every person that you guys have invited here today is someone who has proven that their words align with their actions and they're using their actions to motivate positive change. Right. And what better environment for them to learn than from each other? That's exactly right. You know, I, I, I also, you know, you mentioned public schools and they hold a special place in my heart because I really do believe that we need to start um, with education right. first and foremost and protect education as a sacred right. And it makes me happy to hear about people getting involved in their own communities as opposed to just, and I think we're all, you know, we're all victim to doing this sometimes, but just talking about how things would be different, talking about how things could be better, but not actually activating on Anna, it. Anna, this is at the heart of our theory of change. When someone works in their community around food deserts or around not having enough access to public health services, those discussions among neighbors aren't Democratic or Republican. They're not left or right. They are people who are neighbors, who are citizens in a community who are saying, what can I, what can we do to make something better? Yeah. And the beauty of that is that we don't have to focus on the things that tear us apart. We can focus like a laser beam on those things that are common, our personal stories, and what's possible 
rather than what's impossible. In the next 48 hours, with some of the people we're about to see, you can't help but be inspired by that. I, I think a lot of us are here for that today. I think we're ready for that. I can't see the comments, but can I get an amen? Uh, or whatever you believe in. Um, so I think that we're actually about ready to start with our first Great. guest. I got the little signal, though, David, truly, I feel like I could talk to you all day. I have so many things I want to say, especially because I think positive change in your community is at its heart a bipartisan issue. That's exactly it doesn't it, it, it just is about making your community better in any way that you can. But speaking of making your community better in any way that you can, I would like to introduce Greg Mooney, who is here from the Comer Science and Education Foundation. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Greg, let's talk a little bit about you and what you do. How did you get started? Can you give us a brief summary of your work and how you got started in it? Sure. Uh, I've been working with the Comer Education Campus for the last 15 years. We're on Chicago's South Side, and we focus on uh, holistic education, enrichment, and college success uh, for young people who most often end up being the first in their families to go on to college. Wow. Yeah. The first members of their families to go to college? To go on to college, yes. Oh, wow. That is wonderful. Yeah. Showing it not only to themselves, but to everyone in their own community that going off to a place like college is possible. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Hannah, uh, Gary and the Obama Foundation had an opportunity to partner on our first Obama Foundation event. Gary, um, beyond the training, give me a sense of what the kids were saying after the session was over and why that was meaningful sure. and impactful to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. One of the most special parts uh, was seeing them come in at 8 a.m. in the morning and then seeing them leave at 8 p.m. in the evening. And and what you know, some some sleepy-eyed uh, you know 18 to 24 year olds were sort of uh, ushering into breakfast and then. The just the, the the sheer physical uh, confidence and energy that you saw them leaving at the end of the day. These are 150 young people who who didn't really know each other prior to this day, and they dove into uh, significant community issues. They grappled with those issues. They came up with solutions, and then they left. You know, realizing that hey, we can do this if we do it together. My favorite thing was when one young man said, "I can do anything." which is kind of the point of the work that you do. Yeah. Can I ask you, Greg, how do you empower individuals who maybe have felt like they don't have a voice to be active and engaged during those sessions? Sure. So, so well, at Comer, we really focus on meeting young people where they're at and giving them a whole host of opportunities to engage. Sometimes it's through programs in the art room or sports or through our urban agriculture initiative. And if young people can start to feel success in an area that they have a particular interest in, it buoys them into figuring out ways that they can have an impact and be successful in their communities. Not, not every young person is ready to just hit the streets right away, right? But uh, finding those opportunities where they can engage based on their passions and interests. I think that confidence is one of the greatest resources a young person can have, confidence in their own thoughts or dreams and ambitions, and, and taking that kind of that seed of self-worth and expanding it outside of yourself so that you can create more worth for everyone in your community. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. No, Gary, so the work you do is uh, rewarding and hard at the same time. Correct, um, absolutely. Why do you do the work that you do? What is it the spark? that for you said, you know what, Greg, I'm Greg Mooney, I'm gonna do this. What is it that brought you to this? You know, uh, 15 years ago, I was invited by Gary Comer to uh, kind of join a vision that he was forming. He grew up in the community that we work in in the 1930s. And, you know, years later, you know, well after a long, successful professional career, he decided to dig in uh, to, to, to the neighborhood that was his childhood home. and. Uh, you know, he, he invited me to be part of that uh, a long time ago, and, and it was a special invitation at that point, and that always resonates uh, just about every day in the work that we do. I mean, we, we tell young people, uh, our, one of our mantras is redefine possible. You can redefine possible. You are redefining possible. And, and I would say the, 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 the training day and, and this summit puts that mantra on really really an international scale this is this is no longer just about your community on the south side of chicago this is about so much more it's yeah i love that quote what is it it says uh anything's everything's impossible until proven possible yeah. you know and i think that that is something that we don't 
you know, we don't teach our, our young people early enough in their life that this is something that you can do and you can make. You don't have to just live in the environment you've always lived in. You can expand outside of it. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it comes through incremental steps, you know, building blocks, really. And, and so that, that training day was, uh, you know, a, a really pivotal building block. Wonderful. Uh, and lastly, right before you go, what are you most excited to get out of this summit? You know, uh, I'm... I got a, a few things. I mean, I'm excited to learn. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward and expecting to be inspired. And I think there's also clearly a message that as a community, we're going to come together and, and, and enjoy each other, meet some people, and have fun. That's wonderful. Greg, thank so, you. Absolutely. Greg, thank you so Thanks much for, for joining us. Great. Happy Summit. All right, absolutely. You know? <laughs> Happy Halloween. Awesome. Wow, what a great guy. So awesome. You know, every, I feel like every guest we have here, I want to go after this is done and Google them and really dive in and see what their work is all about. And he gets up every day and does impactful work in a community that too often people gets focus ignored. on the negative, yeah. but he finds that positive and lifts it up in an inspiring way. That's Love amazing. That That's amazing. Okay, further inspiration includes our next guest, Elaine McMillian Sheldon, who is a documentary filmmaker. Elaine, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, can you tell us a little bit um, about the type of films you make and uh, your documentary, Heroin? Yeah, so the film we're showing here is a 39 minute film called Heroin. It's about three women on the front lines of the opioid crisis in Huntington, West Virginia. A fire chief, a drug court judge, and a street missionary as they go out and try to help men and women that are suffering from substance use disorder. What inspired you to start working in, and I guess, the area of opioid abuse specifically? I'm from West Virginia. I grew up there. As if that's yeah. the only thing you need it's to like say. It's like right down the street. Unfortunately, it's part of the childhood experience to know that there's a pill mill down the street. When those got shut down, it quickly turned to heroin, and now it's fentanyl and carfentanyl, which is killing people like crazy. So it's it's no longer just simply opioids in, in the traditional sense that we think of them. Um, so, yeah, it got to the point where obituaries and mugshots of friends were enough that it was I just wanted to explore something maybe more hopeful through the lens of these three women and when you think about the individual stories that you saw and that you put into your documentary as well as the stories that weren't put in what's the thing that makes you the most hopeful based upon what you heard people talk about and say well, I think that recovery is possible. You know, there are many of my own friends who are in long-term recovery. Um, you just have to have resources, you know? And unfortunately, right now in this country, it's very difficult to get access to uh, recovery in all shapes and forms, whether it's 30-day programs or six-month programs. Uh, women who have children can't take their uh, kids to programs. So, you know, how do you get help if your resources are so limited? The hopeful side of that is there are people working to change that. You know, Jan Rader, first responder, she revives five to six people every single day from a drug overdose. Every day. Every day. Um, and she's here right now and she's an incredible, she gives me hope because in some, somehow it's like beyond humanity to me, these women stay positive through this experience and continue to get up every morning and help their community. So, mm. wow. Powerful. It's so, it's so sad to think that the access to the drugs is so much easier than the access and to the resource to recover from those drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Around what, what age did you see people first start to experiment? Well, I think Jan said last year the youngest overdose was 12 and the oldest was 78. 12 years old? Yeah. See, so that, that is devastating because it's like how, how much hopelessness could a 12-year-old possibly feel that would drive them to, to want to turn to drugs? Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, some, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty high percentage of heroin users that actually start with a prescription mm. opioid, so Oxycontin and, and drugs that are prescribed by a doctor. So it's not always straight to heroin. And some people, you know, when they, when they uh, build up a tolerance from pills and their doctor st stops prescribing them, um, they get sick. It's, called, it's dope sickness. It's the flu times 10. It's bones aching. It's, it's a terrible sickness. And we don't have, there's eight detox beds in Cabell County. And wow. that's where these women work. And it's nearly 100,000 people. Um, there's just not enough resources. I really believe in 2017 that there's got to be a better future for pain management than just having everyone start taking the same narcotics. So true. When I think about all the people that are here today from all around the world, and how each one of them have used this skill to try to make their community a little bit better. You're a storyteller. Uh, when you think about the power of story and what you're trying to do, talk to me a little bit about that passion that you have and how that
fits into positive change, not only in West Virginia, but in the country and the world? Well, I think we've seen that we're divided. You know, we, we're, t we're being told we're divided. And so I'm just trying to tell stories that can potentially connect us, that connect us to the bigger themes that we all have in common. Like, yes, it's about addiction and you may self, you may not have addiction in your family or in, in your life, but you can connect to the Jan Raider of the world that gets up every day. And it's, I, it's just about humanity. Like storytelling is, is about making connections between people that are from seemingly different opposite ends of the, of the world, even in America. So sure. hey, uh, what do you hope to get out of the summit here today? Is it that same feeling of making connections with others? Or? I hope to meet the Obamas. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I think everybody here hopes uh, to, we all no, have the same I'm just, hope. I'm just really honored. We're all honored to be here. We're excited. We hope people will come to the breakout session, give us more ideas about how we can help all communities, not just through this crisis, but others. And we're just happy to be here. Great. If you could leave with one message uh, for those at home watching, what would you want them to hear? Um, if you want to learn more about the opioid crisis, watch our film on Netflix. It's called Heroin. Wonderful. Elaine, thank you. Be sure to check it out. Thank you so much, Elaine. Wow. Well, I, it's, amazing. it's amazing. It's also heartbreaking, uh, but I think that's a lot of how this summit is going to be. It's going to be very amazing, inspiring, and also a, a, a cold and shock of reality. And you see the resiliency, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, our next guest, I, for one, am incredibly excited to introduce. Fanboy, fangirl I moment. I know, fanboy, fangirl Come right on. here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Andy Puticombe, the founder of Headspace. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Andy. How are you? I Lovely use your here. app every day. Do you really? I really do. <laughs> well, thank you for using it. This is a huge moment for me. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, she was saying the whole time, she completely ignored me for the first five minutes and said, do you know that's Andy? <laughs> I said, excuse me, sir. That's not true. Right. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> no, but Andy, uh, for those who, who might not yet know about the wonder that is Edspace, which is frankly, honestly, I think my favorite app, um, would you give us a please uh, summary of what you do? Sure, so um, look, it's important to say, kind of Headspace grew out of, it wasn't designed to be an app originally, I was just a, a Buddhist monk who stopped being a Buddhist monk and I kind of wanted to make meditation more accessible. And it's important to say I'm a co-founder as well. Uh -huh. So Rich is, is the co-founder. And, and I met Rich and he was like, this is amazing. We should make this for everybody. Let's put it on an app. And I'm like, that's never going to work. That is never going to work. So we started doing events. And then over time, it kind of it grew to become what is now the Headspace app. And it's, it's essentially meditation and mindfulness made simple, you know, just served up in a digital way on your phone so you can use it wherever, wherever you are. I have honestly introduced Headspace to the most, um, I guess, you know, uh, hesitant to try meditation. And I think that the way that you present it is in a, a very approachable, non-secular format, just to invite people yeah. into giving themselves a little bit of headspace. I think the, the truth is that all of us, no matter what we do, where we come from, like we all need that time in the day just to pause and to kind of reconnect with that place of calm and clarity that I think is very easily lost in a very a very noisy world right now. Right. And in that moment of reconnecting with your own um, sense of self and who you yeah. are, talk about the connection between that moment and then community writ large. Yeah. How does that help bring others in? So that's the bit that I'm, I'm most excited about, I'm most passionate about, and something I'm looking forward to speaking about tomorrow, tomorrow morning. You know, it's really interesting when you come together, groups of people as well. So there's obviously meditating, meditating on our own and how we then take that into the world. But when we come together as well, and when we put down our thoughts, when we put down our storylines, there's no division, there's no conflict, and we're united in silence. And I think it doesn't matter whether we're doing it together as a group, like we will be tomorrow, or this afternoon, you know, or, or any other time when we, when we meditate on our own, we then take that quality into the world. And it's an opportunity to create space in the mind where we can listen to others, where we can better share with others, where we can better learn from others, and, and really kind of contribute to community mm. in a way that I think is very difficult to when we're caught up in our, in our own thinking. It's true. I, I love the analogy um, of the clear blue sky, and I encourage everyone watching, if you, if you don't have any idea what meditation is like, watch the video that explains what the clear blue sky um, that Headspace has made. I don't know what it's exactly called. But I, really at the heart of it is the more, the more space you create, almost like the more space you create between yourselves, the more you have to give and to participate in this world. Yeah. And it's not necessarily as transactional as giving. It's just... Yeah that you are bigger than just your own stress. I, 
I think that's it. We tend to we tend to box ourselves in and to think of ourselves in a, a certain way. We attach labels to ourselves, and we then for we sort we then go on and live that way. I think the more we meditate, the more we realize there's there's a huge amount of space that our potential is limitless, and together. Like that's huge. We can do something really special in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Are you getting lulled into a meditative state just hearing his voice? <laughs> He's the narrator on the app. Uh, Andy, I could literally spend all day talking to you, but I am being told we have to move on to our next all exciting right. guest. Before you go, if there's one message you'd like to leave with those watching, what would it be? To look after your mind, whether it's for yourself or whether it's for the people around you, whether it's for your community, take the time to look after your mind. It's Wonderful. the most important thing. Yes, absolutely. Lovely. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Welcome. much. Wow. Were you starstruck? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, Hannah, I'm the Come CEO on, uh, of the Obama Foundation. <laughs> All right. Well, our next guest is going to be Tamata uh, Amaral de Pontes, who is the founder of the, and I'm going to say this in English, Movement Map Education. Can you say it for me? <laughs> it's called in Portuguese Movimento Map Educação. Wonderful. Tabata, é um grande prazer. Sou português. So eu queria falar com você um pouco em português. Uh, para, para as pessoas que vão ver isto em Brasil, em Portugal, em Moçambique, em Angola, Guiné-Bissau, Cabo Verde, so, um grande prazer. Muito, muito prazer. Sim. It's an amazing opportunity to be here and I'm extremely happy. Great. All I know is uh, obrigada. That's right, obrigada. Thank you. We nailed it. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your organization or how you got started in your work? Yes. So I work with two social movements back in Brazil. One of them, in one of them, we fight for our quality education for all because our public schools are in general very poor quality and we mobilize young people so they can become civic activists for a quality education. So we do conference trainings and organize campaigns so we can make sure that candidates, voters and at the end government officials know that education is the most important way for Brazil to walk. Amazing. So, yeah. And what, what motivated you to begin this work? Because you began... You began this because uh, a while ago. What was yes. the spark? So when I was in seventh grade, because of math Olympiads, I got a scholarship in a private school. And even though the, scholar, the school was only one hour away from my house, I realized how unequal Brazil was. And I realized that in, that inequality started with our school system. And not only was the access to service different in the center and in the periphery where I am from, but also the size of the dreams that people had. So back at home, people were like, they have drug addictions, they were involved with crime, and they would dream sometimes to end high school. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the center, people were dreaming of becoming doctors, astronauts, engineers, and that's absurd. So I got very passionate about education, and I just, I don't know, my mission started there. Yeah, absolutely. What do you hope to get out of your time here at the summit? So, uh, I work with MAP Educação and also a political renovation movement. And in both movements, we have a lot of volunteers. And we have a lot of people back in Brazil that want to, to do things and want to change things, but just don't know how. So I'm really hopeful to make connections and meet people and just get the technology and the tools for us to coordinate all those volunteers and actually start a movement in the entire country. Yeah. This is precisely, this is precisely why we're having this summit. So you and hundreds of others can learn from each other and then go back to your country, your city, and build on the good work you're doing already. That's, what an inspiring story. Absolutely. Thank you, and that's why I'm so happy to be here because it can feel very lonely sometimes, but when you come to events like this, you realize we share a lot of challenges, we share a lot of ideas, and we share a lot of passion. So imagine if we can get together and realize that we are not alone, that it's, this is a global and bigger movement. Yeah, it's like education is the seed, passion is the water, and then possibility is what springs forth. Exactly, and opportunities to change this world. Ah, oh, yes, absolutely. I've got to learn Portuguese. Um, before we, before, it, it's been lovely talking to you. If you had one message to leave with those watching at home, what would it be? So with all the opportunities I've had and all the difficulties I've faced, I really understood and learned that education and politics are the way to transform our societies. And we will do that with more democracy, not less democracy. And I think a lot of societies need to hear that message. Wonderful. Thank you. Um grande prazer. Muito prazer. Muito obrigada. Adeus. Prazer. Obrigada. Tchau, tchau. You know? Tchau.
What were you, were you saying that your your family is from Brazil? Or you no, no, how my, did you speak Portuguese my, just now? Uh, my family, mom and dad, are from Portugal. They immigrated here in 1969, and so I didn't speak English wow. until probably kindergarten. Um, so um, so it's still wow. Uh, yeah, and whenever I'm really upset or angry, it just flows in Portuguese. <laughs> it just comes right out. away. Oh wow, good to know. Yes. All right, well we're on to I think I believe our final guest here today. Uh, I would love to introduce everyone to Jamal Cole, the founder of My Block, My Hood, My City. Anna, thanks for having me. Anna, thanks for having me. David, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, Jamal. No for those who might not know, uh, can you give us a little brief summary about your organization? Yeah, sure. Um, a lot of teenagers in Chicago have never been downtown. They've never seen the lake. Uh, they never waited for a taxi. They never had a boarding pass. Um, they order their food every day through bulletproof glass windows. Of course, that's tragic. So I take teenagers from these under-resourced communities on educational field trips, and I expose them to different cultures, different professions, and different cuisines. Are you from Chicago? I am, soft side all day. Wow. <laughs> so when I ask you uh, what inspired you to get started in this work, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a volunteer at Cook County Jail, to be honest with you. And it was the jail where I, I just asked teenagers, I said, hey, have you guys ever been downtown? They said, no. I said, have you ever seen the lake? They said, no. I said, what do you want to be? I want to be a rapper. I want to be a basketball player. And so I said, you know what? I want to start exposing you to different career fields. So hopefully you have more options to choose from when you uh, graduate college. When I was little, I wanted to be a DJ. Oh, yes? And you, so. <laughs> you got great shoes, by the way. So. Thank you. We talked about our, we shared our mutual love of shoe game earlier. Thank yeah. you for pointing them out. No doubt. Um, what, what are you hoping to get out of the summit here today? I mean, it's an unprecedented, unprecedented collaboration of, of thought leaders from, you know, 60 different countries, for God's sakes. I met somebody downstairs that um, is from London that has a, um, a pet robot that's five feet tall. I met an astrophysicist from Brazil. You know, I'm, I'm just, I want to learn what's some simple solution that people are doing on the block level, and how can I incorporate those solutions in, in my community? And the amazing thing, Jamal, which is not amazing, but those same individuals, or many like them, uh, when they hear your story about how you began your path and how you do your work every day, yeah. are as inspired by your commitment to change as you are by theirs. Yeah. And my question for you is, the work you do is hard every single day. What is that spark that you have that you can fall back on, that even on the days where you don't want to do it or you have some doubt, you keep at it? You know what? I, I, um, it's God's put a battery in my back. Mm. And, you know, I'm just not willing to, to say no. I'm not willing to give up. And, um, and I'm a reader. You know, I, I, I want to create change. I want to dedicate my life to creating change. And so you can save five years just by reading a book. And so I'm like, wow, this is how they did it back in the 60s with no social media. I have LinkedIn today. I have Twitter today. There's no reason I should fail. So I, I'm really about being practical and then talking to the leaders in my community and asking for advice. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What lessons have you learned from the leaders of those communities? Um, just, you know what, um, one of the main lessons that I learned is that just it's about your perspective, right? So. Yeah. It's a sale, it'll be two salesmen, like a salesman will look outside and say, wow, it's raining real bad outside. With weather like this, no way I can go out and make sales. Another salesman will look outside and say, it's raining real bad. What a great day to go out and make sales is everybody's going to be home, especially the salespeople. It's the same thing with community organizing. Some people in Chicago, they look outside and say, wow, you know, the city's messed up, the weather is messed up, the politicians are messed up, and they don't create change. But some people like me, I look outside and say, man, the city is messed up, the weather is messed up, these things, and I still go out and create change. So it's, it's my perspective that um, that's, that's my part. It's about your perspective to see potential instead of problems. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm just all, you know, I got a wife at home and a little six-year-old daughter, so uh, my dad ran for Alderman when I was 11 years old, and so I got to collect flyers with him or collect signatures in front of Jules, pass out flyers. That was very inspirational. Seeing President Obama do his Senate debates on Chicago Tonight, that was very inspira inspirational as well. So, so um, we've got this wonderful video on the Obama Foundation website of Jamal doing his work in the community. Yeah. It's one of the videos that we have that just people flock to, not only because of the type of work, but the way you do your work, Thank you. uh, which for me is why Chicago is the appropriate and right place to be the center of this movement for active citizenship. Yeah. And you're just a great example of it. So well, inspired every day, man. Well, thank you guys for coming to this city. Yeah. And we're the epicenter for community organizing you in got the it. world at Chicago. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Before you go, if there's one thing you'd like to say to leave with the viewers at home. You guys got to go buy a hoodie. Go to yeah. <laughs> formyblock.org, buy a hoodie. Every hoodie helps teenagers go on educational field trips. Get yourself a hoodie. And you also sell hats? Hats. We're going to have some shoes sometime soon. Yeah, you got, got some got nice got shoes like this? Hats. That'd exactly. be perfect. Jamal, exactly. thank you so much for being Thanks here. For
Appreciate you, man. Thanks, you, man. Thank you. Ah, man. Hey, thank you so much. Wow. I am really excited for your weekend ahead. And that's just a handful of the hundreds of people who all have those individual stories that are just the reason why I am hopeful every single day. Wow, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, guys, uh, I would love to spend more time with you, but I believe that there is something you all want to see, which is the beginning of this amazing summit starting momentarily. I'd like to say that throughout the next few days, you can come back to the live desk, which will feature additional interviews from Obama Foundation staff and summit participants. If this is just a sampler platter, I am ready to dive into the main course. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. And now to the main stage.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and Mrs. Obama. I am from Paris, France. My name is Daniel Flynn. I live in Melbourne, Australia. My name is Adea Sturkey. I am a native of Marion, South Carolina. My name is Brian Gunawat, and I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. My name is Paul Green, and I live in Anvil, Kentucky. My name is Bektor Iskander, and I'm from Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic. My name is Jose Andres, and I am from Spain, uh, Barcelona, but I live in the beautiful Bethesda, Maryland. My name is Eddie Tai, and I live in Saigon, Vietnam. This is Genevieve Whitaker, and I am from St. Croix, Virgin Islands of the United States. My name is Amy Woodall, and I'm from Houston, Texas. My name is Sheldon Smith. I'm from the south side of Chicago. My name is B. Flo, and I live in Lusaka, Zambia. Attending the Obama Foundation Summit today is attending an event with the most inspiring and dedicated leaders in the world. To hear about all the great things going on in different places, how we can bring those ideas back to rural America and make those work for us. It is a fantastic opportunity for me to network with like-minded people. I think it's important to actually get connected to as many people as we can, to actually see what kind of changes we can create together and also to learn from each other. It can be rocket fuel for unlocking entrepreneurship and innovation around the world. Collaborating and meeting other leaders and finding out ways that they've implemented change in their own communities. I believe in the power of people working together for social good. I am excited about meeting fellow young leaders from throughout the world as we share our experiences and learn from each other. How are they looking at impact and why is this work so important to them. To see what every one of you in this amazing room is about to do to bring effective change to the world. There'll be a feeling in the room that this is the start of something remarkable, the start of many, many great stories that will grow. You know, ideas that are birthed in the room at summit, ideas that have come from it, but together we'll be able to work together to create even bigger impact in our world. I'm looking forward to hearing about all the amazing work uh, that you're doing. Please welcome our host, Liz Dozier. Welcome to Chicago. Let's do it one more time for Chicago. I am absolutely honored to be your host today. Whether you're in the room with us or you're joining us from around the world, we're just so glad that you're here. Before we get started, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge the magnificent performers from a people's music school. That was Ke Amy, well, hold, hold on y'all, hold on. That was Amy, Kelly, Julia, Jason, and Melanie. I want to tell you a couple things. One, there are Chicago public school students between the ages of 12 to 17, and it gets, guys, it gets better. Hold up, hold up, it gets better. And they learned that piece for you in this room. They learned that within the last 48 hours. Now you can give them a round of applause. Now you can give them a round of applause. What a complete honor that the Obama Foundation has brought us here together today. Over this next day and a half, we're gonna to explore together. We're gonna to share ideas. We're gonna learn from one another. We're gonna dig a little bit deeper. So you might be asking yourself, so who are we gonna do all these fun things with? Well, let me tell you. You're gonna be doing them with people from 60 countries from around the world and from every single state in our union from organizers to educators, journalists to scientists, small business owners, and the list just goes on and on and on. 
We are all here, all of us, every single one of us in this room, we're all here in the long shadow of the organizers, of the activists, of the optimists, of those who came before us, those who really believed, those who believe in the promise and in the possibility that lies within our communities and within the power of connection, and they believe that it was possible for us to work together despite our differences, as do we. Yes, <laughs> that's true, we do believe that. So I'm gonna challenge you, over this next day and a half, I really want you to go to a breakout session where you might be unfamiliar with a topic, share a meal with someone, introduce yourself to someone that you don't know, like me. You can, wherever you see me in the next day and a half, you can, you can, we can chat, and I can tell you about where to get the best deep dish pizza in Chicago. Now, if you hear laughter, you hear laughter because those are the Chicagoans, and Chicagoans know this is a real debate. But you can see me, and I will give you what the real answer is, okay? I promise you that. So why don't we just take a second? We're going to build a community here. Just take a second and introduce yourselves to those who are kind of behind you and in front of you. Go ahead. Take a minute. No, I... You have a new one? Perfect. You good? Got it. Perfect. Hi, I'm Logan. Nice. Hi. together. All righty. We're coming back together in five, four, here we go, three, two, one. Okay, for those of you who might not know, I was a former high school principal. Don't make me come off this stage. Everybody moving on back to their seats. Here we go, coming back together. Almost there, almost there. This is like when I used to be a teacher. It's like calling the class back together. All right, great. Got to know some new friends. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm Liz Dozier, and I was the former, the proud former principal of Finger High School on Chicago's far south side, thank you, in the Roseland community, and I'm now the founder and CEO of an organization called Chicago Beyond, which we started uh, 18 months ago. And Chicago Beyond is really invested in building community leaders and supporting community-led organizations. And we do that by investing in organizations, learning from them, and really ultimately help them grow. And we have so much work to do here in Chicago, along with all of you, but we know that we're just getting started. I don't have to tell you how hard that work is. Each person in this audience understands that perfectly. It's about putting in the work every single day and showing up again and again and again. It's the relentlessness of it all, which is what we're here to do, to show up again and again, to build community, to build bridges. In the words of the great poet Marge Piercy, my hope for us today and over this next day and a half is that we weave real connections, create real nodes, and build real houses. This is our chance, so let's go ahead and make the most of it. Absolutely. And with that, I want to introduce us to an extraordinary thinker. He's just the best person to really start us off for the day. His name is Anad Girdadas. He, he is amazing. <laughs> you got it. 
He's an award-winning writer who reports from deep within communities. He's gonna kick us off by talking a little bit about his book, that he's, the latest book that he's written called Winners Take All. It's about people attempting to change the world. And what we love about him is that his intellect is truly matched by his heart. Can you please welcome Mr. Girdadas? Forty years ago, this autumn, my family's American journey began. My father crossed an ocean carrying seven dollars and his parents' prayers. He planted them into American soil and soon began to grow a family with my mother, whom he'd met in French class in Bombay. They had two children, a son and daughter of Ohio. My father called us the original Cleveland Indians. <laughs> it's funnier now. Now their children have children. The seeds they planted turned out to be perennials, an American dream in bloom. Whatever stories brought you into this room, you are here answering a call for citizens to change the world. I am here because the name Barack Obama sounds less strange when it comes after Anand Gerdardas. <laughs> and it's true and because I spent the last few years reporting on people who pursue and who resist change. Today, as the summit begins, I want to share some of what I've learned from both. I want to discuss why change is so urgent today, why meaningful change nonetheless remains elusive for many changemakers, and how this season of tempests gives changemaking fresh promise. First, the urgency. With an assist from Lou Reed, we live in an age of magic and loss. Our globalized automated economy is full of magic. Every day, low prices and next day delivery on that single Gatorade you one clicked. But it is also full of loss, of jobs, of the dignity of steady work, of chances to rise. Our technology promises the magic of constant connectedness, yet we feel loss in being atomized on separate screens, trapped in filter bubbles of belief, bobbing in a sharing economy in which the technologists seem to own all the shares. Our societies have experienced the magic that occurs when pluralism flourishes and the marginalized assume their proper powers. But loss stalks those victories as millions revolt against change and supremacies resurface. The losses threaten the magic. We need to invent new systems, new economies, new ways of life to seize the magic while redressing the loss. That is change's burden today, and why change cannot wait. Despite this urgency, many of our most visible, celebrated attempts at change keep failing to alleviate the present inequalities and resentments. In my reporting, I found that real change escapes many change makers because powerful illusions guide their projects. First, the illusion that the world can be transformed one starfish at a time. Second, the illusion that you can change the world without changing people. And third, the illusion that you can change the world without being rooted in it. The starfish illusion is captured in a popular parable. Two friends see thousands of starfish on the beach. One picks up a few and throws them back into the ocean. The other, staring at the multitudes, asks, what difference does it make? The thrower replies, makes a difference to that one. In the usual telling, the thrower is a hero, making the small, doable change. The other guy is a Grinch. But I think the Grinch is misunderstood. I imagine he was just getting started with his questions. Why are the starfish being beached? Will these few rescues distract us from actual solutions? What if the thrower is complicit. A fisherman who dredges the seabed, or an oil man whose work worsens climate change, or even just a consumer of mussels or oil. Now it gets real. The thrower is making a difference to that one, yes, but he's also part of the problem. Many of today's most prominent attempts to change the world are afflicted by this uneasy duality. It's a bank that recklessly speculates helps cause a financial crisis that costs multitudes their small business, pays a fine for it, 
and then is celebrated widely in change-making circles for a program mentoring small business owners. It's a tutoring program for poor kids in a place like Bridgeport, Connecticut, that attracts affluent volunteers from Greenwich who would revolt if you proposed to help those same children by funding public schools equally, not by local taxes. It's a belief in changing the world so long as it costs you nothing. The starfish illusion focuses change makers on the difference they make to those they choose to help. Yet they risk avoiding the causes of the disease and remedies that would actually cure it. And they avoid these things in part because facing them could implicate powerful people, or perhaps even themselves. They lack the self-awareness and self-skepticism that genuine change requires. The second illusion is that world changing doesn't require changing people or people changing. As our society fractures, some change makers are drawn to visions of progress that don't bother with suasion. I'm thinking especially of those of us who live in what we regard as the America of the future and who can think of ourselves as woke, aware of injustice, committed to pluralism, willing to fight for it. As wokeness has percolated from black resistance into the cultural mainstream, it seems at times to have become a test you must pass to engage with the enlightened, not a gospel the enlightened aspire to spread. Either you buy our whole program, use all the right terms, and expertly check your privilege, or you're irredeemable. Is there space among the woke for the still waking? Today, there are millions who are ambivalent between the politics of inclusion and the politics of exclusion. Not quite woke, not quite hateful. Men unprepared by their upbringing to know their place in an equal world. White people unready for a new day in which Americanness no longer means whiteness. People anxious about change's pace, about the death of certainties. The woke have a choice about how to deal with the ambivalent. Do you focus on building a fortress to protect yourselves from them, or a road to help them cross the mountain? A common answer to this question is that the people angry at losing status don't deserve any help. They've been helped. I understand this response. It is hardly the fault of the rest of us that those wielding unearned privilege bristle at surrendering it. But it is our problem. The burden of citizenship is committing to your fellow citizens and accepting that what is not your fault may be your problem. And that amid great change, it is in all of our interest to help people see who they will be on the other side of the mountaintop. When we accept these duties, we may begin to notice the ways in which our very different pains rhyme. The African-American retiree in Brooklyn who fears gentrification is whitening her borough beyond recognition probably votes differently from the white foreman in Arizona who fears immigration is browning his state. Yet their worries echo. When we learn to detect such resonances, we gain the understanding of other people that is required to win them over and not simply to resist them. It isn't enough to be right about the world you want to live in. You got to sell it, even to those you fear. Finally, there is the illusion that you can change the world without being rooted in it. Many of today's most venerated world changers rarely attend local community meetings. They remain better connected to other privileged world changers than to any plot of earth. Citizens of the globe who risk being what British Prime Minister Theresa May has called citizens of nowhere. This is understandable. When you seek to change the world at large, its struggles don't accuse you. When you seek change at home, you have to deal with all you have voted for, done and not done, and quietly benefited from. The creep of business thinking into change-making fuels this escapist citizenship. Many change makers no longer ask what they owe a community, but where they can find the highest marginal impact. I wonder if the values of optimization and effectiveness have caused some change makers to forget the value of loyalty. Frida Kahlo once asked, if we are not our colors, aromas, our people, what are we? Nothing. 
And you, you don't love your mother or country because she's quantifiably McKinsey certified as the best. <laughs> I hope not. But because she is yours, this kind of love mustn't be spreadsheeted out of the work of change. When leaders fail to belong in this way, communities are starved of leadership and leaders of what you learn from being part of community. I know. It came from we might not have had such a fearsome backlash against trade and immigration if more of us had been locally enmeshed and listening. Striking roots doesn't mean ignoring large systemic problems or merely tossing starfish. In fact, when rooted, you observe how systems actually affect people. Yes. President Obama's aunt yes. once said, if everyone is family, no one is family. She told him that in Kenya, not long after he had laid roots in Chicago. He went to work in this community and married Michelle Robinson, a daughter of the South Side. Raised a citizen of the world, he became a citizen of particular earth. Rooting put him on the path to leading the free world. I've spoken of illusions today because it has seldom been more important to see. The starfish illusion keeps our eyes on those few we can rescue, but real change is systemic and self-implicating, urging us to see our role in vast, complex problems. The woke illusion tells us to circle the wagons, but real change is missionary, seeking to expand the circle. The global illusion tempts us to be thinly everywhere, not thickly somewhere. But real change is rooted and comes through bargaining with your fellow citizens as equals. These days, I find myself filled with a strange kind of hope. When times grow dark, the eyes adjust. What I see stirring in the shadows is people realizing that they have neglected their communities in an age of magic and loss. All around, I see people awakening to citizenship. For decades, we imagined democracy to be a supermarket where you popped in whenever you needed something. Now we remember that democracy is a farm where you reap what you sow. For decades, we thought of citizenship as a possession. Now we remember that it is something you do, not something you hold. For decades, we told ourselves it was better to solve problems privately, outside the pathways of citizenship, because politics was broken. Now we remember that a country is only as good as its politics, and that political decay is not an excuse to flee, but a reason to dive in. This moment makes it plain that we need a new age of reform, not just a flurry of initiatives, that the best defense against hatred is offense, an evangelism of love, that changing the whole wide world must never be a refuge from tending to our own places, Look within, reach across, anchor down. Great good has been known to rise from seasons like this. Let us seek it, let us seize it. Thank you very much. I think we're, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. Thank you so much to Anan. Our next speaker comes to us from Brazil. 12 years ago, he co-founded an online community that has now become the leading online community of Afro-Brazilians. Please welcome Paulo Nunez. I was born in Salvador, Bahia, northeast of Brazil the African capital of the Americas, a beautiful place with a unique culture, a UNESCO heritage site, a place with a lot of culture that you can see in this photo here. But I'll tell you one story. I don't know if you know that, but Brazil has the second largest black population in the world. We have received 4.5 million Africans during the slave trades, it was about 10 times more than the United States. We also were the last country in the Americas to abolish the slavery in 1888. Brazil is for sure a very diverse country. 
I was lucky to be born in a place you see in this photo. All right, not a swimming pool place. <laughs> the other poor side of the photo. And there, I've seen many problems like racism, violence, oppression. But there, I've also learned about one important thing, resilience. That made me understand more about the roots of the violence. And the roots of the violence is inequality. Inequality generates problems such as poverty, police abuse, and mass incarceration. That's in Brazil. This problem is even bigger than the United States. But today, I want to talk to you about another major problem there in Brazil. Media representation. As you can see in this photo, that's how the mainstream media in Brazil show our people, our kids, our ladies. One photo is from a famous movie in Brazil, City of God, and the other photo is from a TV show in our prime time, in our major TV, just a few years ago, a guy using blackface to represent a black woman. This is not only morally wrong, but I guess some media executives need to read more about our statistics. 53% of the Brazilian population are Afro-descendants. 53%. A population with more than 100 million people. A population bigger than France, UK, or Germany. And then I'll give you another example of how the racism operates in Brazil. And you see our media. You see that there is no much black faces over there on the newsstand as well. So in Brazil, we don't have a TV or radio or newspaper owned by a black person. Why are we so invisible? That's really wrong. But 12 years ago, myself and a group of friends decided to create a black media organization to push for better representation of black people in our media. We started six years without any support, all volunteer, and now, finally, we have some good partnerships. And two years later, we decided not only to seek for better representation in the media, but also to create our own daily news. This, here is Correio Nago, our website that covers stories that traditional media is missing every day. And I'll show you some stories that we are covering right now. For example, the government of Brazil is trying to remove a historical Afro-Brazilian community from their territory using their force against a centenary community. Also, fundamentalists are attacking Afro-Brazilian religions online. And not only that, they are also destroying their traditional temples a clear example of a religious intolerance. But we also have in Brazil to spark a big movement. And this big movement now have a lot of YouTubers, creators, bloggers, that are taking over the traditional media with new stories and new narratives. And guess what? Now, the traditional media is looking to partner with us. That this photo you see here is from an event that we put together a traditional newspaper in my city with digital influencers. And I'll give you another example. This is Tiama, a friend of mine, digital influencer that's now on the morning show on the major TV in Brazil with her Afro hair, beautiful custom, and big smile. <laughs> So now, the media is learning from us. It's amazing. So we come from hundreds of years of invisibility and oppression in Brazil. And now, finally, we have been heard, we've been seen, and hopefully, we want to be more respected and represented. This story is not about only the Afro-Brazilian story. It can be related to many other contexts in the world. We need to have more inclusive media 
that mirrors the society we live in. Our voices must be heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Paolo. Up next, we have Marjorie Shaka, a rising star of the European Parliament. She just got off the plane from Kenya, actually last night, into Chicago. She's been heading up the European Union's support for a fair and free election for the last few weeks. Let's please welcome Marjorie. Politicians are disconnected from reality, and people trust car salesmen more than their representatives. I hear this is sounding familiar, and indeed, trust in politicians is low. It's too low. And it is upon us to rebuild that trust. Yet, the promises of a return to a romanticized past are deceiving, and Closing borders or erecting walls are not the answers to today's global challenges. Instead of turning inward, we must appreciate that the public interest is also at stake in the global arena. At the moment when technology connects us worldwide, it is a matter of leadership and civic duty to shape the society of the future based on the democratic values that have brought people the highest quality of life in order to preserve that quality. The reality is that all politicians and each government see influence flowing elsewhere, from nation-state governments to the local level to networks and multilateral organizations, from public institutions to private companies, from democracies to authoritarian states. Now, some may say from the positive side, individuals have become so empowered that they no longer depend on government. Isn't that great? But on the downside, democratic principles are being eroded and even replaced with profit models and authoritarian governance. The digital revolution is leading to a redistribution of power that is not matched with the redistribution of accountability and oversight. So, is this the end of democratic governments and will algorithms, artificial intelligence and robots just take over? Will all politicians be fired? No. But we do need a radical rethink and reinvent democratic governance in a world where everyone and everything will soon be digitized and connected. While the role of governments is changing, global technology companies are now the ones confronted with challenges that traditionally landed exclusively on the desks of diplomats and politicians. Should media apply censorship under pressure? Who to call when the internet is shut down entirely in an attempt to control people? and which legal checks and balances are in place before content is taken offline, according to which law. Global technology companies are the new sovereigns, but they're designed and engineered to maximize profit, not democracy. And the de facto norms that they set can lead to conflict with the rule of law, also in democracies. A large social media platform recently removed pictures of a centuries-old statue in Italy, sexually explicit. The same happened to the iconic picture of the napalm girl. A video of a political speech I personally gave addressing the need to end torture was removed, taken offline, labeled as spam. Now, I know Speeches in European Parliament are not always the most inspiring, but they could not legitimately be labeled as spam, and political speech must be free. Social media platforms have become political arenas and catalysts for junk news sprawling. They're also the only place where most young people see news. 
but probably the most far-reaching impact of digitization and subsequent power shifts is the loss of the state's monopoly on the use of force. States are less and less capable of maintaining exclusive control over critical infrastructure and of defensive and offensive technologies. Instead, they procure technologies, often with far-reaching capabilities, and then they're not able to stop worldwide proliferation of these tools afterwards. We must urgently avoid that the digitization of everything becomes the privatization of everything and the weaponization of everything. When every device, from a hairdryer to a self-driving car, can be used for malicious attacks, even without the user knowing it, who is responsible for enforcing safeguards? With the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, the relationship between the public interest and private companies takes on an entirely new dimension. So in short, technology companies have a growing impact on the state of democracy, and states operate with a growing dependence on technology companies. In this new reality, the interdependence of well-functioning digital infrastructure applies to both governments and companies. They need it. Because no one can afford a breakdown of the global banking system, for example. Now, historically, when new technical possibilities arose and interdependence became stronger, the momentum for global norms opened up. With the introduction of cars came the need to develop new traffic and safety laws. And the law of the seas was developed to ensure that free passage and governance of ships through international waters was arranged. And to avoid mutually assured destruction or nuclear warfare, non-proliferation treaties were born. So now is the time to develop the governance of our global online space. Without norms governing the global digital networked ecosystem, the legal vacuums that companies continue to operate in will grow wider and deeper. And this, in turn, risks further eroding trust in tech companies themselves, as well as in the governments for whom these global players seem entirely out of reach. We already see pushback against big Silicon Valley players who are accused of negligence to defend democracy. But when global tech giants do take a greater responsibility for safeguarding democratic and public principles, it will have a positive ripple effect. We should aspire to see democracy going viral. And there is no time to lose. With growing ambitions of authoritarian states to dictate global norms of their own, wishing to maximize control over the internet, bringing governance of technologies within their territory, the threat against the very promise of a global, open internet has never been bigger. So this is the time to build a democratic digital convention involving civil society groups, private companies, and yes, governments. This digital democratic convention would develop a global democratic set of norms that would be ascribed to, no matter where a company is located. We must draw a line in the sand. Governments must be stopped from interfering with people's rights and the core infrastructure of the internet. But tech companies should be stopped when they interfere with core democratic principles. The alternative, an internet ruled by the law of the jungle, is unfolding before our eyes. We see a science fiction version of 1984 with total control of people's every digital move. Leadership is key, not only as a moral or civic duty, but it's in our self-interest to deliver upon the promise of a networked society that empowers individuals and respects and protects fundamental rights online. So instead of promising to press the pause button on globalization and digitization, or dreaming of a return to a romanticized past, it is our role to redesign governance in a hyper-connected world and to base it on the very democratic values that have brought people the highest quality of life, instead of us adopting norms that others set, whether for maximal power or profit. But this global ambition 
starts with credibility at home. Clearly, retreating behind borders or walls is not an option when the world gets more connected every day and when so much is at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is now my great pleasure to continue the conversation about technology and democracy and the challenges we, we face. And I would like to welcome on stage Siva Vaidya Nathan, who is a professor of media studies at the University of Virginia. He is the author of the book, The Googleization of Everything. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Marit. Thank you. So let me start by asking you, what went wrong? Because there oh. was such a promise <laughs> of the revolutionary impact that technology would bring, and here we are. Well, you mentioned George Orwell's 1984. Uh, I'd like to reflect on a different book, a uh, different dystopian book, um, uh, which was Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. In that book, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the authoritarian mindset takes over not because we're afraid of some centralized power uh, that surveils everything and instructs us through fear, but in that book, the citizens are lulled into complacency. They're so entertained, they're so distracted, um, they're so fractured that they don't care about retaining power in the, in the people. Um, and I think that that actually might be our greater fear. But remember back in 2011, early 2011, as we watched on our television screens, young people filling the streets of Tunis and Cairo, and we thought at that moment, oh my gosh, this was a story we were told. We were told that social media platforms were um, engaging and informing and organizing these uprisings and striking a blow for democracy. And we thought, oh my gosh, 2011 is 1989 all People over again. People talked about Twitter revolutions. They I did. remember even Facebook you know, revolutions. And, uh, yeah. It turned out not to be accurate and not to be true and not to be complete. In fact, what we've learned since, especially in 2016 and 17, is that if you wanted to build a machine to spread propaganda for authoritarianism and nationalism, religious nationalism, ethnic nationalism, you could not do better than our current social media platforms. They're basically designed for that. They're designed for that because they amplify powerful emotions. That's what their algorithms are designed to do. Um, every time we see something that generates powerful emotions, we click, we share, we comment. And those, we teach those algorithms to spread those high emotion messages as far as we can go. So what counts as high emotions? What generates high emotions? Pictures of puppies, pictures of children, and hate speech. I mean, yes. there's more to it, but... Quite a difference. Exactly. So, so what have we seen in recent years? We've seen the rise of dangerous nationalisms in, uh, that have been energized and guided and, uh, and essentially performed on social media platforms in places like the Philippines like India, like most alarmingly in Myanmar. But is this also a bit of a sort of, you know, what people would label a cat and mouse situation where mm. agency is mostly extended? So yes, individuals are more empowered, but so are governments or uh, those who, who are in the boardrooms of these big companies. How well, do you see that? Or is it really only exacerbating these very powerful feelings of, of hate in the cases well, it of exacerbates, the countries you mentioned? Well, it exacerbates any strong emotion. That strong emotion can be towards something that we might consider positive, right? You, you could, and we do, see people use these tools to organize um, for civil rights, for uh, human rights, for voting rights. We've, we see them at the local level, we see them at the global level. So it's not that these tools... I've used tools, it for my campaign. Exactly, right? So they're I'll very powerful tools for motivation, but they're not powerful tools for deliberation uh -huh. or debate. And so what we've had by structuring our political lives through these tools, we've rendered ourselves highly motivated, mm -hmm. angry, and yet disconnected, especially from those who might disagree with us. So is this emotion of anger stronger than an emotion of you know, happiness or...? or... Uh, well, the happiness stuff, the puppies and the babies, that's what social media platforms were created to do. And, and, and we all signed up for them, 
because we wanted to see pictures of our cousin's babies and, and lots of other cute, lovely things. Yeah. Um, but since that time, since we first signed on to social media, the whole idea as driven by these companies has changed to the point where Facebook especially now strives to be the operating system of your life. It wants to guide your commercial life, your intellectual life, your political life, and your social life. And, and by allowing ourselves to be so immersed and distracted, mm -hmm. and by allowing this company to reach 2.2 billion people around the world, we've essentially bought into Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And can you talk a little bit about the global differences? Because what uh, you're saying is it's very powerful. We're talking about, you know, operating system of life. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a, a challenging concept. Yes. But of course, life in different parts of the world is very different. Ah, yes, um, yes. You, you, you spoke briefly about Myanmar, where we're seeing very concerning developments. Uh, what, yeah. what do you think could be the different impact, the specific impact, in countries that are not as free as the democracies of this world, or where perhaps a different political system um, yeah. so, is governing? Yeah. So, so many parts of the world have different media ecosystems. And so much of our discussion, I think, is unfortunately guided by the rather complex media ecosystem of North America or Western Europe, where we have multiple outlets. You know, we might not get all of our news from Facebook. We might only get half of our news from Facebook, which is probably bad enough. But in a place like Myanmar, where um, it had been a closed society, for so many decades, and then only in 2014 did people get high-speed phone connections, data connections, mm -hmm. through their phones. And immediately, Facebook came into that society and, and introduced its, um, its sort of socially generous, as it phrases it, um, uh, uh, service called Free Basics, where um, people who use Facebook on their phones don't have to count that use against their data plans. Mm -hmm. So essentially, in Myanmar, Facebook is the entire information ecosystem. It's the only source of information. It's the only source of propaganda. Mm -hmm. And those who would want to, to foster genocide are using Facebook quite effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think also for us policymakers, right. this, of course, is a huge challenge how to make sure that we still aspire to get all of the internet to That's all right. of the people all so of the time, as well see, as the rights. So I'm wondering what you see, like what are, where are the points of resistance that you see, at points of resistance and hope in, in Europe or in Kenya where you were most recently um, working? I mean, are there, are there people working on platforms that can uh, undo some of this or push back against it? Are there motivations and, and movements going on? Well, I think the, the whole posting of junk news and spreading of sensational stories is, is one that we see globally. Mm. Uh, also in Kenya, where you know, ethnic tensions are unfortunately very, very strong, and rumors spread like wildfire, and it could lead to real actions. It's not just a story people read online and then they go on with their lives, but it can re lead to people taking to the streets and you know, um, unfortunately using violence uh, at times as well. So, Indeed, I think also for us policymakers, you know, uh, European Union is one of the biggest uh, donors to development programs. The whole notion of media literacy, pluralism, uh, freedom of expression, to have different voices countering each other is crucial. Right. So that we don't leave it up to some minor initiatives where there's no, no uh, diverse voices reaching people and where people may be confronted with technologies where the education is not yet there. And I think we're all struggling with that. It's not. Uh, global South or, or, or um, developed world issue. I think this educational issue is hugely important. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited by the idea of creating a global conversation about these very issues, which is what you spoke about just moments mm -hmm. ago. Uh, uh, but beyond that, I think there's a lot that we can do. So imagine. Yes, let's talk about what we can do <laughs> instead of the doom and, and gloom, and, and, and also what people here at the Obama summit can do themselves. I have, I have some answers, but let's not pretend that they're going to fix anything. That's soon, okay. Let's make right? let's But make imagine this. What if you measured for one week the amount of time you spend on social media, and you cut that time in half, and you took that time and you devoted it to volunteering in your community or engaging with your neighbors yes. in some positive way? Yes. Right? So that little bit of contribution, that little bit of shift in your attention, and this is really the thing. It's about the battle for your attention. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we also need then to reinvest in the countervailing forces the countervailing forces that support science and education and positive political engagement. Execute your politics locally, in your barber shops, in your bar rooms, across your fences. Um, just a few blocks from here is, is the Harold Washington Library. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite buildings in, in the United States of America. It's a symbol of all that we can be and aspire to be. A place where communities can gather and hash out difficult issues in their community. And if you go in there any weekday, 
you will see uh, elementary school kids looking for a, a quiet, well-lit place where they can do their homework. Uh, you can see people seeking dependable information, knowing that it's a hard thing to find these days. You That's can also right. see homeless people seeking a moment of heat or relief, and, uh, and maybe a, a few minutes with the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sense that all people in this city are welcome in that place, and that that building is so well-constructed, well-invested, that's a symbol of what we need to be spending our time and, and resources on instead of social media. Now, given that, we have to actually actively reinvest in our schools, our communities, and especially our libraries. But also, we have to reinvest in each other. It is so much better to offer someone a handshake than to offer a click, a like, and a comment. Well, that's easy. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Marici and to Siva. That was illuminating. Our next guest isn't a policy expert. He is a world-renowned artist from right here in our own backyard of Chicago. His work is all about the revitalization of communities, and specifically the South Side. One of my favorite quotes from him is that beauty is a basic service. Please welcome Theaster Gates. <laughs> How y'all doing? What's happening? <laughs> I wanted today to, um, to talk about sticks and stones. Maybe sticks, stones, and clay and abandoned buildings. But for the talk's sake, let's say sticks and stones. The city of Chicago came to me with a, a pretty big problem. We had 90,000 trees that needed to be torn down over the next five years. So ash, boar, beetle infestation, and they were trees all over the city, all over the region. Parkways, uh, neighborhoods, uh, playgrounds, all would have to have these trees removed. And they came to me as an artist, and they said, um, can you make something with these trees? And they were thinking five or six trees, I'd do something poetic, and um, the other 89,976 trees would be um, uh, mulched. The artist in me decided that we should not uh, make art, but in fact, we should build a mill. The mill should be a place where um, 96,000, 90,000 trees could come, and that the problem of the trees would become an opportunity for brothers and sisters who lived on the south side. So I found some land that was adjacent to my house. There were a lot of empty lots. Those empty lots were no longer imagined as empty lots. They were imagined as the storage space, the temporary storage space for my new vision. Now, having a mill doesn't sound like a work of art. It doesn't sound like an installation. It doesn't sound like a, a new form of public work, but for me, um, imagining that something ambitious and great could happen in my city, on the south side, in the face of what seems to be nothing but the, the seemingly negative. I was convinced that if I were to talk to a couple brothers around Dorchester, that they would be eager to help me uh, run my mill, that I would find a miller, and I would talk to some friends who got a little bit of cash, and we would renovate this uh, former Commonwealth Edison powerhouse, build a mill, and start milling. And so um, in my artistic pursuit, I didn't learn how to mill. But I think that the, the real um, the gift that I feel as an artist is that all the time, I'm interested in two things, how to be as poetic as possible and how to be as pragmatic as possible ways that a big problem like 90,000 trees becomes a super sexy opportunity for beautiful things to grow on the south side. And so if you guys need wood, 
I'm not supposed to advertise anything like that, but I got some extra wood. That was sticks. Um, many of you guys know I'm a, I'm, I'm a clay guy. That was my training. But I also just love raw material because I'm always thinking about how modular units have the ability to make really cool things happen. So um, there was, a, there was a, a church down the street from where I live called St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence was going to be torn down. There was nothing I could do about the teardown because there were demolition. There were folk who already were, had, had gotten the building and were going to do interesting things with it, perhaps. But I asked the demo crew if I could go in and if I could have one last conversation with St. Lawrence and Jesus. Up in the cupola, you can see the Last Supper. And I said, hey, man, while you're finishing your chicken, can you just come down and help me figure out what we're going to do with this site is there a way that the Holy Ghost might uh, be in my hands? And as a result of it being in my hands, we find something to do with this land. I found out that St. Lawrence was a builder of, of churches and libraries, and I'll come back to Larry. <laughs> but I asked the demo crew if we could hire another crew on top of them, and that we would then palletize all of the bricks, clean the bricks up, Try to make good with the remains. Make good on the sticks and stones. And they said, yeah, we'll sell you, the, you, know, we'll sell you the, the pallets and we can figure it out. We figured it out. I right, had some brothers. And we found ourselves um, in the conversation of um, building. What would it mean to take these, uh, uh, these old bricks, these old sticks, and then reimagine them in a different context? So I found myself with a mill and a brick manufacturing company. When the Walker Art Center asked me uh, if I would do a piece of public art, I said, I'd love to, but you got to buy my bricks. <laughs> That's economics. That's creative <laughs> economics for all you theory people out there. The sticks and stones have allowed me to then think about abandoned buildings and construction in new and interesting ways. And I, and I have to admit that, that when you work on the south side, if you build in something, it's not like you have to work real hard to find help. The brothers will come up to you and say, hey, man, can I help you? And so um, if we think about the history of Stony Island, it was a once bustling, really amazing place. Um, and around Stony Island, on Dorchester, Kenwood, Kimbark, uh, all of those things in pink are buildings that we've successfully restored over the last six or seven years. Uh, but this building was the last of a particular kind of great building. But it was in really bad shape. And so we started, you know, cleaning up the joint. You know, I asked the mayor of the city of Chicago, um, can I have the building? He said yes. Now, many people think that when, you know, you get a building for a dollar, that the building is a dollar. When you get a building for a dollar, the building is not a dollar. <laughs> but what I found is that if, you, if you're thoughtful about sticks and stones, you're thoughtful about the men and women who you hang out with, if you think about these deficits as an asset and start to train other people to help you out, really beautiful things might happen. And so now... Now we have this thing, we call it the Stony Arts Bank. Um, we bought the land adjacent to the bank. When that happened, people thought I was crazy. They said, you know, you shouldn't be spending all your money on this old crazy land. And, uh, and I said that my values weren't their values. And if, if Stony Island never had economic value, the fact that I live here is value enough. Right. Now, it just so happened that this new foundation, this new center was moving right down the street. And after the announcement of this center, people started calling me a real estate mogul, a new real estate <laughs> genius, some kind of, uh, uh, why was I taking all of the opportunities from other people who wanted to invest on Stony Island? <laughs> that ultimately I was interested in using these sticks and stones to house the things of black people. 
that I wanted to have a beautiful place on the south side, in black space, where great things could happen. And I think we're almost there. In my world of art, um, problems lead to opportunities and should lead to action. Thanks so much. He's just so powerful. Every time I hear him speak, it just gives me, gives me chills. Um, our next speaker has spent her life advocating for all Americans to have an equal say in our democracy, an equal chance in our economy. Heather McGee is the president of Demos, a public policy organization, and is currently working on a new book about the costs of racism to white people. Please welcome Heather. <laughs> The economy is not the weather. Economic news may come to us like a weather report, the stock market going up or down like the temperature, but it's not actually unseen natural forces that dictate the way the wind will blow economically. A better way to think about the economy is as a massive multiplayer game where the most powerful players usually government officials and business executives, are constantly able to change the rules that make it easier and harder for some players and some teams to score points. In today's economy, the name of the game is inequality, and there just aren't that many winners. But the good news is it doesn't have to be this way. We don't just have to weather the storm of widespread economic insecurity. We can rewrite the rules of the game so that everybody wins. Back when my parents were born, the purpose of the game was different. The goal was to create a lot more winners. Bobby Kennedy summed it up this way, saying, it is the essence of responsibility to put public good ahead of private gain. So the players in power wrote the rules so that one man with a high school diploma and a unionized factory job could support a wife and children, buy a home, have health care and a guaranteed retirement pension, and even save for the future. If he wanted to go to college, he could get a free government grant, not a loan. And the CEO of his company typically played himself about 25 times what he paid his average worker. Meanwhile, in Europe, nations were rewriting their rules to express a solidarity forged in the fires of war. And all over the post-colonial world, independence was the rallying cry. The Cold War was beginning to pit two nuclear-armed superpowers against each other in terrifying ways, but the rivalry inspired unprecedented public investments in science and education. In the industrialized world, the path to a secure, middle-class life was fairly open, and government paved the way with laws and programs to promote the public good. But in the decades after the civil rights movement, the most powerful players began to articulate a new purpose for the game. Ronald Reagan's vision supplanted Bobby Kennedy's when he said he wanted, quote, an America where above all, people can still get rich. It became a bipartisan consensus that if there were more points on the board for some players, the rest of the players would eventually do better. It hasn't worked out that way. My generation is proof. We make about 20% less than our parents did at our age, struggle with childcare as a new expensive necessity, and instead of pensions, we have personal stock accounts that could disappear in a crash. We're less likely to own our homes, and we carry five-figure student loan debt because of the disinvestment from public college. Racist rules around who can own what has created a wealth divide that's actually grown over the past generation. 
For every dollar of wealth owned by white families, black and Latino families have less than 15 cents. And that advantage is not about education. A white high school dropout has the same wealth as the average college-educated person of color. Half of American families couldn't pay a $400 bill that landed on their doorstep without going into debt or selling something. Meanwhile, a CEO typically pays himself not 25 times his average worker, but 300 times. The unions that used to help ordinary folks have a say in writing the rules have been under relentless attack and have retreated from one out of every three workers to just one in 13. The changes in the laws on capital and mergers have given rise to mega corporations and national chains that dominate the marketplace, smothering competition and small businesses. And of course, climate change is a rising cost to our economy that goes unchecked as fossil fuel companies are allowed to put next quarter's profits ahead of the next generation. So what I'm saying is inequality isn't just a natural byproduct of megatrends like automation, globalization, and demographic change. These phenomena are real, but they're circumstances that we in a democracy should have the power to shape and control. The problem is our democracy has become as unequal as our economy. In the U.S., the least wealthy among us are the most likely to get caught up in the needless red tape around voting. And in recent years, we've had a rash of gerrymandering and deliberate voter suppression, photo ID, cutting early voting, purging citizens from the rolls, all to skew the electorate upwards even further. And then there's the money. Less than 1% of the population provides the vast majority of the funds that determine who runs for office and what issues get political attention. Maybe the donor class's influence wouldn't matter so much if they were a representative sample, but Demos's research shows that wealthy donors actually have different policy priorities, particularly about the economy, than the majority of Americans, even within their own parties. We can all feel it. There's something broken in the spirit of our democracy, in the root word of our democracy, in the demos, the people. I'd like to argue that it's no coincidence that the rules have changed to make it harder for the average American to get by at the same time as the face of the average American has changed. Since the civil rights movement integrated our society and we lifted the racist bans on immigration, we have had a deep and growing anxiety in this country about who is an American. And that has changed the purpose of the game. In a way, what's happened to our entire economy is like what happened in the segregated South after the courts ordered integration of public amenities and the white-controlled towns drained their public swimming pools rather than let black families swim too, destroying a public good they once enjoyed. For three generations now, a political movement has stoked white anxiety about who the public is, successfully linking government and unions to undeserving minorities and gaining support for cutbacks in public spending and limits on collective action that end up generating higher privatized costs for all of us. Too many of us have been conditioned to look at our fellow Americans and see other and not us. It's a phenomenon that's happening all over the world as politicians cynically pit communities against each other for their own gain. But just imagine 
what a society's economic policy would look like if our notion of us included everyone, everyone who calls a nation home. I think it would look like being proud to pay taxes because taxes are the investment that the country has made in your success and you feel like you need to help provide for our future even though you may not recognize what that future looks like. I think it would look like government and business and philanthropy working together to ensure that the basics of life, a great education, an old age with dignity, they would ensure that these things are not out of reach for most people, but are the minimum that we can guarantee for us all. And I think it would look like CEOs of companies seeing their responsibility as not just to create goods and profits, but to create good jobs, jobs with dignity, decent jobs for their fellow human beings. And why not start that here? The United States is the world's boldest experiment in democracy, a land of ancestral strangers with ties to every community on the globe, met here with the audacious promise that we could become one people. Right now, today, politics is offering us two visions of why all the peoples of the world have met here one in which we are nothing more than competitors, and the other in which perhaps the proximity of so much difference forces us to finally admit our common humanity. There are those who are holding on, white-knuckled to a tiny idea of we the people, who are denying the beauty of what we are becoming. They are saying that demographic changes are the unmaking of America. No, they are the fulfillment of it. For when a nation that was founded on the belief in racial hierarchy truly uproots that belief, then we will have discovered a new world. That is our destiny. To make it manifest, it's going to be up to our generation to rewrite the rules of our economy so that its purpose is to forge solidarity across lines of color, origin, and class. To give lie to the notion that those who have more money are worth more in our democracy, in our economy. In the 20th century, America placed a bet on its people and it unleashed an economic force that changed the world. Today, the largest, most diverse generation in American history is ready for that same commitment, a commitment to the human capacity within all of us, to the idea that out of this nation of many, we can become one people, a demos. Thank you. So much to Heather, that was so powerful. Before we continue on with our next speaker, I want to make sure that I give you a couple housekeeping notes. So if you'll take a look at the screens on either side of me, we're going to show a couple of things. First, um, I want to make sure that you know that after this session, we're going right into breakout session one. And so you'll know that from the schedule, you got exactly where you're supposed to go. So check your schedule. And we're going to meet back in here after that session at 6.15. So we're starting right on time. So come on back in. Uh, secondly, the dinner buses are going to depart right after Prince Harry's talk. So right after that, we are going to be leaving right out and the buses will be right outside. And lastly, a quick reminder on the Wi-Fi, which is right up here, so that you have that uh, for your Wi-Fi needs. <laughs> um, our penultimate speaker is one of those people whose very presence just makes you want to be a better citizen. She is beyond amazing. I'm so excited for you to hear her. She serves as a coordinator for the National Rural Assembly, and she makes this really strong case about how urban cities and communities have so much to learn from rural communities. Would you please join me in welcoming Whitney Kimball Coe. <laughs> Thank you. So I remember.
remember the day when I told my parents that I'd changed my mind about everything. I was 20 years old, a sophomore at Queens University of Charlotte in North Carolina, and I wanted to come home. Well, not right at that moment. I wanted to finish school, but after that, I wanted to find my way back to my hometown of Athens, Tennessee, population around 13,000 people in the valley of the southeastern Tennessee area. I was nervous to say it out loud. This was a complete reversal of everything I'd been professing up until that moment. Since I, was six, since I was six years old, I'd been conditioning myself for a life of great success in a big city somewhere. It was never a question in my family that I was going to leave, to leave my home for good. But on this day, Sitting on the floor in my sophomore dorm room, I called my parents to tell them that I'd changed my mind. This is the moment where many rural parents would likely hold their ground and say, oh no, honey, don't you remember what it was like living here? We can't give you all the opportunities you're gonna find out there. Why don't you just think a little bit longer about this decision? But my parents didn't say that. Instead, they said, we'd love it if you came home to Athens. I was so relieved to hear that, because I needed Athens. I'm home now, building a life with my husband, Matt Coe, and my two daughters, Lucy and Susanna. My parents live one street over, and my brother, Andrew, and my sister-in-law live right behind us. We call our corner of Woodward Avenue the family compound. When I ran for a seat on Athens City Council, our neighborhood was full of with wit signs. I didn't win the seat but I fell in love with my community all over again. Athens is pretty much the same as I remember. It still has a lot of the cultural markers of a small town. We like to stay within sight and sound of each other. A trip to the grocery store is like going to church. You know it's just gonna take longer than you think it will because you're gonna see everyone you know. We're also an intergenerational place and everyone wears multiple hats. So I can serve on the Friends of the Library Board with my first grade elementary school teacher and work backstage at our local arts center with my OBGYN. <laughs> you don't have to belong to or attend church, but people know who goes where and how often they're in the pews. And when catastrophe strikes, like the tornado that hit us in 2016, we pull out all the stops for our neighbors. There's nothing fancy or cutting edge about my community. We have more amenities than some rural areas and less than others. Rural people walk a hard line between disparity and abundance. In the US, we're nearly 20% of the population and about 80% of the land. Yet we have historically been bypassed by government and exploited by big companies who have extracted our resources and left precious little investment behind. We know about trauma and addiction and suicide. We know about shuttered hospitals and crappy roads and underfunded schools and spotty broadband. And we know that one in four kids lives in poverty. Those are our kids and our youth who are told they have to leave to save their lives. That's all part of the rural story. But also part of our story is what I call a practice of participation. We can't control the systemic barriers and disparities that hunt us and haunt us. We can't control the forces of globalization and automation that have taken our livelihoods, our jobs. But we can control our response to these forces. And usually that means we just keep participating. We keep showing up at funerals and potlucks, at PTA meetings and choir practice, at football games and city council meetings. We keep checking out library books and performing in community theater productions. We make our plans for here and about here, as writer Joe Carson says. And that regular practice of participation is what characterizes our relationships and it gives us the ability to live and work and worship together in spite of disagreements. And it helps us withstand the tangles of partisanship too. It's hard to dismiss someone when you expect to see them tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. I hope you're not hearing me say though that rural futures are secure because we have community spirit. I'm not saying that. 
Rural people are pissed as hell about the shape of our economies and our infrastructure, and we're deeply worried about our children. There is absolutely a role for thoughtful government and philanthropic participation in this story. Better policies and more investment are critical for our future in rural places, especially if we want our young people to answer the call to come home. But what pulled me back to Athens is this deep knowledge that we already have something essential in place. I believe there's something incredibly powerful about the way we show up with each other in small daily ways, the way we stay within sight and sound of each other. It's a practice. That's the only word I can think of to describe what we do. Contemplative scholar and teacher James Finley offered the lesson this way, find your practice and practice it Find your teaching and follow it. Find your community and join it. I watched my dad head to work in the dark hours of the morning most of my life. He's a community banker, and he's retiring today after more than 45 years. Yep. Art Kimball, 45 years of investing in the people of our community. When he'd get off work, he'd go to the next thing, Wednesday night choir practice, soccer practice with me and my brother Andrew, or play practice at the art center, which my mother started. Often, he'd go off to a board meeting at the local YMCA or the Economic Development Board. For 45 years, my dad just kept showing up. And now that he's retiring, I don't think he's gonna be able to unlearn that practice. Consistent participation in community is simply the hardest work we can do in this moment whether we live in a rural or urban place. It's hard because I think participation requires a certain kind of humility and a level of commitment that is antithetical to the zeitgeist of our times, which tells us that individual identity is what defines us and claims us. What I've learned from living in Athens is that participation in a collective future is what nourishes us. I think it's this desire for a meaning-filled life in community that's resonating with many of my contemporaries. I now have a cohort of 30-somethings in Athens who are putting down roots and running the show at various community institutions. Lindsay, Lauren, and Jen are running the Arts Center, started by my mom. They were born and raised in Athens, and now they're back, raising their families here. We have coffee every week, and we help one another raise the four daughters we have among us. Through my work with the Center for Rural Strategies and the National Rural Assembly, I've been lucky to be part of a network of young people who, like me, have in some way answered the call or the challenge to return home. Appalachian writer Wendell Berry calls us homecomers. It's like a song, homecomers. Nikiko Masamoto is an artist and an activist, and she returned home to work on her family's organic peach farm in Delray, California. Tim Lampkin is a young man in the Mississippi Delta who's utilizing the power of entrepreneurship, yes, to distribute or to disrupt the racial wealth, wealth gap in his region. Anna Claussen is leading civic dialogues in rural Minnesota about some of the most politically polarizing topics of our time, like climate change. Marlene Chavez works with vulnerable populations in communities along the Texas-Mexico border and Philan Tree is focused on affordable housing issues on her Navajo reservation in Arizona. So not only am I part of a local group of homecomers, but I'm enriched by a national body of young leaders who are committing to practicing life and community. On the one hand, we're not doing anything new or brilliant. We're just modeling the practices that we grew up on. But I do believe that we're doing the thing that is truly necessary right now in this time of great divisiveness and polarization across every kind of border. We're doing the hard work of staying in community. My mother loves this piece from playwright Joe Carson. I lived in harmony and good union with my friends and neighbors, and I have kept a piece of earth in working order. I'm proud of that. We're facing huge challenges right now about how we'll continue to feed and fuel our planet. But even more important, I think, is this question of how we stay within sight and sound of one another across all the barriers and borders we put up. I think rural people have something to teach us about repairing the breach. Thank you.
Thank you so much to Whitney. Our next speaker needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. So that, it's a little intimidating following Whitney and the rest of these speakers. Uh, I am not accustomed to being so intimidated, but uh, I could not imagine a better way to open the first Obama Foundation Summit. And so we are in the south loop of Chicago. Up that way is downtown. This way, I think, I hope I'm pointing in the right direction, <laughs> is the south side. And the reason that I'm so excited to gather all of you here today, and we've got remarkable young leaders from every corner of the globe, from 60 countries, from all across the United States, young people who are already doing remarkable things in their communities, setting up health clinics or starting companies to provide renewable energy in very poor areas, or beginning to advocate on behalf of groups that have been left out and forgotten of communities. The reason I'm so excited to see you all here today, in part, is because this is where I started. Now, this isn't where I was born. I was born in Kenya. No, that's a joke. I was born in Hawaii. But I, I was, uh, and, and I, I had a little bit of a misspent youth, did some things that fortunately were not recorded because there was no social media, <laughs> hence I was ultimately able to be elected president. <laughs> but in college, uh, I either began to develop a social conscience or at least all those values that my mother had whispered in my ear started to come back to me about being kind and being useful and caring about people who were less fortunate than you and being a peacemaker rather than an instigator and trying to lift people up instead of putting them down. And so I started thinking to myself, how could I have an impact? How could I make a difference? And if you're here today, wherever you're from, whatever you look like, however you worship, whatever your cause or calling, one thing that binds all of you together is at some point in your lives, you've asked yourself the que same question, which is how can I have an impact? How can I make a difference? So uh, I was inspired in particular by the civil rights movement here in the United States of young people going to door to door to try to register people who had never been able to vote before, and freedom riders who were willing to sit down and suffer all sorts of indignities in order for their societies to be transformed. But there wasn't any movement around at the time when I graduated from college, so I looked around, and ultimately there were a small group of churches on the south side of Chicago that were interested in dealing with steel plants that had closed and racial turnover that had taken place and had decided to hire a community organizer to help them stabilize their communities. And they had no money, so all they could afford to hire was me. <laughs> and I didn't really know what a community organizer was. But 
I arrived here, and for the next three years, I traveled all through the South Side and worked with leaders in churches and block clubs and community organizations, and we tried to you know, build a new park in a neighborhood that had been ravaged by the drug trade, and we tried to build after-school programs so that young people could aspire to college. And we worked on environmental issues in a public housing project that was near a uh, landfill. And I didn't really set the world on fire. I didn't lead a movement. But what I did learn was that ordinary people in local communities can do extraordinary things when they're given a chance, when their voices are heard, when they come together, when they recognize themselves in each other. I learned everybody has a story in them that is sacred, and that so often those stories match yours, even if you don't immediately recognize them. Similar hopes and dreams and disappointments. And so even after I left community organizing, the lessons that I had learned about people and about being rooted in communities and listening and sharing stories and creating power from the bottom up rather than the top down to bring about real change, those lessons never left me. And that was just a few miles from here, 10 minute, 15 minute drive close to where uh, Theastra showed those pictures, close to where Michelle grew up. And I carried those lessons with me even after I'd become president of the United States. And I'd start traveling all around the world and all around this magnificent country that I'm proud to be the citizen of. And I would meet young people who were just like me, maybe a little better than me, who had asked themselves how could they make a difference and who had started sharing their stories and listening and gathering stories in their communities and had begun to mobilize and organize and make things happen. And so throughout my presidency, whenever I got down, whenever I got cynical, whenever things got tough, the one thing that I knew would always pick me up was when I met those young people with that vision and that talent and that motivation, that desire to have an impact and make a difference. So when I asked myself after the presidency, uh, how could I have an impact? When I asked myself after turning 56, it's not too late you can still have an impact. What should you do? <laughs> the thing that was most exciting for me was the idea of creating a hub, a venue, a place, a network in which all these young people across the globe and across the country from every background and every race and every religion could start meeting each other and seeing each other and teaching each other and learning from each other. Because if we could create an architecture, a platform for those young people to thrive and to grow and to scale up all the amazing stuff that they were already doing locally, and not just to root themselves locally, but then be able to germinate and seed change all around the country and around the world, then there's no problem we couldn't solve. There's no aspiration that we might not reach. 
And so that's the plan. That's the vision. And although we've got some pretty good ideas about how to get started, before we started rolling out a whole bunch of programs and before we started to lock in and make investments about buildings and uh, fellowships and internships and this and that and the other, we thought, why don't we practice what we preach and listen first and find out from a representative sample of all these amazing young people, what is it that will be useful to you? What will be important to you? What excites you? How can you most effectively learn from each other and work together and stay connected and build a movement for change? And that's what this summit is here today. So our goal is not to present some fixed theory of how change happens. Our goal at this session is not to pump you with a whole bunch of PowerPoints and data and information and a blueprint for how you are going to go back and do the stuff you're already doing even better because in many ways we want to learn from you as much as we want to maybe share some of what we've learned. In other words, this is a big brainstorming session. This is a big hackathon. This is an experiment in us trying to have a, 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 a collective conversation which we will try to shape and direct so that it's useful to you. But you are my co-collaborator, you are Michelle's co-collaborator in creating what ultimately the Obama Foundation will become. And we could not be more excited about it because in just seeing what you've already accomplished, uh, if, if, if we can pool all the experience, knowledge, resources that's represented in this room, and we do have a few people who don't, like me, still qualify as young, but have done a few things. Uh, I am absolutely confident that we are going to be able to, uh, together, uh, create something that uh, isn't there right now. Uh, and that is uh, uh, an architecture, a platform whereby all the young people around the world and who are coming behind you uh, will be able to either digitally or in person or in their local communities because you've gone back and created something that they're going to have a little more help, a little more direction, uh, a, a better uh, idea of just how it is that they can harness their own power and have their voices heard and create the kind of world that we all want. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And in closing, I just want to add a couple of points. As you've noticed, we're going to have some breakout sessions. We're going to have some plenary sessions back in here. Uh, there aren't a lot of rules. You seem like a fairly well-behaved crowd. Um, but I would just offer a few guidelines. Uh, one is listen to the people you're with. Not just the folks on the stage, but in breaks, during meals. Share your stories with each other and Try to make a connection, forge relationships. And if possible, find somebody who is not like you, who doesn't look like you, who doesn't think the way you do, who has a set of experiences that uh, you don't 
on the surface at least, share. Point number two is, uh, I want you to have a strong point of view and don't be afraid to articulate it, but make sure that <laughs> when you disagree, you're not disagreeable. I thought Anand put it very powerfully. Real change comes through persuasion and openness to others. And if your starting point is, you don't get me because, you can't get me because you're not a woman. You can't get me because you're straight. You can't get me because you're black. You can't get me because you're white. If that's your initial starting point, then you will not grow and you certainly will not help the person next to you grow. Uh, so have a point of view. Be rooted in your experiences and don't be afraid to share those, but listen, be open. Uh, don't be partisan because our goal here is not uh, to create a political movement. Some of you may be aspiring politicians, and I believe firmly in politics, but I also believe that the moment we're in right now, politics is the tail and not the dog. And what we need to do is to think about our civic culture, because what's wrong with our politics in part is a ref reflection of something wrong in our civic culture, not just here in the United States, but in many places around the world. Uh, third rule is uh, for Michelle and myself, this seems trivial, but it's not, no selfies. Now, I say this because if, uh, one of the weird things about being president is I found people were no longer looking me in the eye and shaking my hand because they approached me either like this, <laughs> or like this, and it seems trivial, but it's not. We had a terrific dis debate and discussion about social media, and I am all pro-social media. I would not have been elected president had it not been for young people organizing in states all across the country through social media. It is an amazing tool, but if it is blocking you from having a conversation or seeing somebody and recognizing them and listening to them because you are so busy trying to get a picture, <laughs> then you are, I think, in, in, in some ways uh, contributing to what separates us rather than trying to break through. Right. Now, so, so that seems trivial, but that's big. It also will allow Michelle and me to have actual conversations with you, which will be nice. Uh, and the fourth thing is have fun, uh, because uh, the work all of you do in local communities, the work you aspire to do on an even broader stage is hard, and it's full of frustrations and setbacks. And for every step forward that you take, sometimes it feels like there will be two steps back. And part of what this potential community provides, part of you being able to meet and connect with people who are doing what you're doing in other places around the country and around the world, is maybe to make you feel a little less lonely. And to know that the noble pursuits you are involved with, uh, that there are a lot of other people out there who are rooting for you and feeling the same frustrations that you do and sharing the joys of those small successes that can turn into big successes. And you know, part of the reason why it's so important for us to incorporate folks like the Aster and some of the other writers and filmmakers and artists who are here today is because bringing about change is not just eat your peace. There should be some joy in it. Uh, you know, that's an expression that maybe is too 
American. That means it's, <laughs> because in some places maybe people really like peas. Um, it shouldn't just be a burden. What an amazing gift. What, what an what a extraordinary uh, privilege to be able to make the world better, to, to work with others, and be able to look back after a year or five years or 10 years or 20 years and say, that child has an education because of the work I did. That, that person has healthcare because of the steps I took. That, that group of people who didn't have a voice now have a voice. That, that entire society of women now can do things that used to be exclusively reserved for men. Those gay or lesbian young people no longer fear who they are. What, what, a, what a powerful thing that is. What a joyous thing that is. That's what you represent. So have fun. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Michelle Obama. Please make your way to your scheduled breakout sessions.